Dear friends and family in the Lord, may God fill you with his rich grace and mercy. May he open your eyes to see the many blessings that he does all around you every day. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do give thanks to you for each day that you bless us with. We thank you that you are gracious and good and kind, forgiving and merciful. Help us, Lord, always to see the way that you work in our lives and the world around us. The way that you, have not, that, you, that you are there, that even as the world sometimes wants us to believe that you have abandoned us, that you are there, that you are constantly working, and that it is not you alone, but you send your whole angel armies to guard and defend us. Help us to have this confidence. Help us to have true sight in you each day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today as we do continue our study on the battles, uh, the battle of the Lord, the battles of the Bible, we're actually not going to look at a battle. As we go to Elisha, as we look at Elisha's situation, you'll notice it never really turned into a battle. In fact, if anything, we would call it a botched kidnapping, but not a battle. However, it does reveal something to us. It reveals uh, something to us about the Lord, about the way that he works. Now here, Elisha was in trouble. He has King Ben-Hadad, the Syrian king, well, he, Somehow, Elisha knew his plans. He knew his thoughts. He knew where his troop movements were going to be. And he would pass those on to King Jehoram, the, the king of Israel. And you can imagine how difficult that would be if you were the commander of the army, the king, and you never had the surprise element. So he sent his men to surround the city, to capture Elisha. They came down to Dothan. Elisha wasn't scared. Look again at 2 Kings 6. Nowhere does it say that Elisha was scared, not even concerned. His servant was, but he wasn't. And he prayed, Lord, open his eyes, so that his servant would see what he already knew. He knew that the Lord was there. He knew that it was not the Lord alone, but he was there, and he was there in force. And when his eyes were open, he saw not just some mere, piddly, fluffy angel, like Hallmark might draw a picture of, but instead... He saw an angel army, fiery beings and horses with horses and chariots. Now the reason this is important to us is not just because it's pretty amazing to hear about the angels and how powerful and fearsome they are, but the reason this is important to us is because there's a battle going on just outside of our view every moment of every day. Now we might not always be aware of it. In fact, most of the time I don't think we are. But there is a battle over our souls. There's a battle for our salvation. And the devil, he fights tooth and nail. He fights dirty and he is constantly fighting. And the Lord is constantly defending us. Sending his angels into the trenches. Sending his angels to guard and keep us. To protect us. How many of us pray those words? Deliver us from evil in the Lord's prayer. Many of us every day. But take them for granted. We pray those, those words, deliver us from evil. But how many of us think about the evil we're asking for deliverance from? How many of you have recently thought about the battle over your soul? In the last week? In the last month? In the last year? No, I, I think we, go, we grow complacent. We grow comfortable. It's easy not to think about this battle that is going on all around us because it's scary and it's unpleasant to think about. It's not one that we really want to, that will help us have good dreams when we go to sleep. But it is there. Martin Luther, in one of my favorite quotes, which I am certain I've shared with you before, he talks about our complacency. He talks about how we look at this battle and don't take it very seriously. In the large catechism, he writes, if you could see how many knives, darts, and arrows are at every moment aimed at you, you would be glad to come to the sacrament as often as possible. But there is no reason why we walk so securely and heedlessly, except that we neither think nor believe that we are in the flesh and in this wicked world or in the kingdom of the devil. We don't take it seriously. We don't think about that battle. We don't think about the spiritual warfare that's going on constantly around us. And why should we? We're so caught up with the rest of our lives, aren't we? We have so much going on in our lives right now. We have families to take care of. We have our, our, our spouses that we need to, to, to love and show our support to. We, we have our jobs that we have to fulfill. Why should we think about this battle? It's just one more thing, isn't it? 
But we need to take this battle seriously. We need to look at this battle and th- be thinking about it constantly. Because it, it does have eternal significance. This battle is for our eternal souls. And there is a real place called hell. And that's where Satan wants us to go. But so often, in that complacency, we just, well, we develop blind spots. We put it out of our mind, put it out of our thoughts. As most of you know, over the past last week or so, our family drove nearly 3,000 miles, just shy of 1,400 each direction, so almost 3,000 miles to and from Houston. And many times throughout that trip, I had to look over my shoulder, check not just in my mirror, but look over my shoulder and make sure that no one had snuck up there, no cars were there for the safety of our family. In the same way, many of you have, in your driving careers, you learn to check your blind spots as well. And you know, some of you, what happens when you don't check your blind spots. I won't ask you how many of you have not checked your blind spots and regretted it later, but when we don't check our spiritual blind spots, it's just as dangerous, in fact, more dangerous. Because when we don't check our blind spots, when we don't look, that's when the devil sneaks in. And we all have these blind spots. These places where the devil tempts us, lays those traps. For some of us, it's, it's, it's in anger. It's, we, 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 we know that certain things, certain people, they irritate us, they frustrate us, they push us to say things that we don't mean to say. But we don't prepare to talk to those people. We don't prepare to face those situations. Some of us, we, we know, well, maybe there's, we enjoy good humor, jokes now and again. But what about those jokes that are less than God-pleasing, rude and offensive? Some of us know that we get talking to our friends. It's good to support our friends, to talk to them, to share our, our love with them. But sometimes when we get talking to our friends, it's not just about the weather or the amazing things that are happening. But sometimes it turns to conversation about people. It turns into all-out gossip. James says it very well that our tongues end up controlling us instead of us controlling our tongues. How about sitting in front of the television, the internet, browsing through channels, browsing through web pages? Not necessarily even ending up on those that are pornographic, but just those channels, those web pages that are inappropriate, things that are less than wholesome. We all have blind spots, and they're not just in our day-to-day lives here, but even in our spiritual walk with God. We have these blind spots that we we ignore, the blind spots that, that we know that sometimes our lives get busy, and that if we don't make time for God, we won't take time for Him. If we don't make time, we won't take time. And how many of you know that to be true? Think about that for just a moment. When you don't make time for God during the week, When you don't make time for God on Sunday morning, do you take time for Him? No, it becomes a blind spot, doesn't it? And we all have these blind spots, and the devil uses these blind spots, and he exploits these blind spots. He takes advantage while we're not paying attention. And while we don't see those spiritual darts, those spiritual spears, those spiritual knives that Luther talks about, they're there. He's constantly carving away. But when we're not taking time to be in God's word, to consider his protection of us, to to ask for the guidance of the spirit, we're leaving leaving ourselves unarmored, unprepared for battle. We're opening ourselves up for attack, attack. And the devil, he will exploit those attacks. Like I said, he doesn't play fair. He doesn't wait till you're ready. He doesn't wait till you line up. Historically, it used to be that the armies would line up across the field from one another, and then it, they wouldn't start until they were lined up. And then guerrilla warfare came. They believe it was part of our success in the Revolutionary War was because we ad- adopted some of those guerrilla warfare tactics. Well, that's what the devil does. He doesn't wait till you're ready, till you're lined up. In fact, as Peter refers to him as a roaring lion who attacks when we're not least prepared. Listen to Peter's words in 1 Peter 5. Be sober-minded, be watchful. 
Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. The devil doesn't want us to be watching. He doesn't want us to be prepared. In fact, his attacks come when we're most vulnerable, when you're at your wit's end, when you're already frustrated, when your patience is run out. That's when he attacks. That's when he lays those traps. When you're tired, when you're weak, and when you're vulnerable and weary. That is when he attacks. When you just feel so worn out, so depressed, so much in despair because things are not going your way. That is when he attacks. And we might say that's not fair. That's not fair. But that's the way he works. He isn't fair. He's dishonest and he's a cheater. And as Jesus tells us from the beginning, he is a liar. He'll bring those attacks whether or not we're ready. The worst thing we can do, though, is to wait unprepared. To let those blind spots sit there. The worst thing we can do is to just ignore them. To stay complacent. To just keep going on as we do. Because when we do, that's when the devil does attack. But thanks be to God, he is not ever complacent. God is never complacent in your life and in this world. But he is constantly moving and constantly working among us and around us and through us. He is constantly there. And he is not simply through us, but he is sending his angel armies. I just, again, I I have to read it to you again because it's such amazing when you think about his angels. And I want you to erase that hallmark picture. I want you to stop thinking about those fluffy little floating angels that uh, were often depicted. But just listen to, again, to those words that are used in 2 Kings. The mountain was full of horses and chariots, a fire all around Elisha. Think about when we hear about fire in the Old Testament. Think about when we hear about fire. It always refers to God. It refers to God as he was the pillar of fire who dwelt among his people. It was the fire, the burning bush that did not burn up. It was the fire. It was God with his people. When God sends his angels, he is with them. He is leading the attack. He doesn't reserve it for some archangel. He is there himself with us. And if that's not enough imagery... I encourage you to turn to Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel chapter 10. Go home this afternoon and look at those verses. And it talks about the cherubim. And Ezekiel talks about them as beasts, fearsome beasts, who are ready to go to battle against the fearsome beasts of the devil. And that is what we need. We need those who are constantly fighting for us. Because we do grow weak and we grow weary and we grow tired and we grow worn. We grow complacent and we need not only God's angels to fight for us but we need a God who will fight for us a God who chose not to bring down a legion of angels to take his place but a God who took on human flesh and took our place by going to the cross we needed Jesus to be our savior and he chose us He chose us, you and me. He chose to give his life so he could crush the power of the devil. Paul talks about in Romans chapter 16 that he came with peace. But he came with peace to crush the power of the devil. To crush the the power of the devil and his demons. To crush the power of death and to crush the power of sin. So often we are blind. But when we open our eyes, when we pray that the Spirit will open our eyes, we can see how God is constantly working, how God is constantly bringing victory for his people. And I know it's true. Spiritual warfare is not pleasant to talk about. It's a nasty and ugly and disgusting subject because it does talk about evil, and we don't like to talk about evil. But when we talk about evil, we can talk about good. And we can talk about grace. The goodness of God who came the grace of God that he showed to us by forgiving our sins. When we talk about evil, we can be reminded that evil has not and will not ever win. It may seem at times as if evil has grown that that foothold, if temptations seem to come more and more. It may seem at times like the the demons just must be partying constantly. But their victories are short. Because the battle is the Lord's. 
And true sight comes when we see that, those, that, that, that the demons' victories are short, that Satan is defeated. You know, there's a book that I read some time ago. Well, actually, use two books. But Frank, many, if any of you are familiar with Frank Peretti, he's a Christian fiction writer. And he talks about the spiritual warfare in two of his books, This Present Darkness and Piercing the Darkness. And in those books, he talks about how we are constantly assaulted by, by the devil, by the, you know, the demons who try to tempt us to lust or to anger or to frustration or to despair or depression. And how that they, the angels, are ready and waiting to take, take the field when we pray. For the most part, I would agree with him, except for the fact that God sends his angels even before we pray. Even before we need, know we need his support, God is there. He is defending us. You know, so often in our lives, we look at the way that God works and we chalk it up to coincidence. We chalk it up to, oh, well, that's nice. I'm glad that I made it here safely to church. But how many of us stop to think about that it could be God working through his angels in our lives? I know that many of you were praying on our trip to Houston. And I know that by the grace of God, we didn't even have so much as a blown tire. But even if we had, even if we'd had a blown tire or a blown gasket or a severe car accident, I know that God would have been with me then. And that's what true sight in the Lord brings. It brings that assurance that God is with us in all situations. That God is with us when, when, whether things are going well or things are going rough. And if you don't hear anything else in the sermon, don't forget that. That God is with you. That God is with you no matter what situation you're in. And he always will be. And when we think about true sight, we know that right now, that we see as if in a mirror, as Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 13. But he is going to give us true sight. When we will look upon him in his glory. When we will join him in eternity. Because Jesus went to the cross. Because he died. Because he rose. We will rise with him. And we will see that the devil's defeat is sure. So I pray that the Lord opens your eyes. That you would see every day. That the Lord is with you. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, we pray that each and every day, no matter what trials we face, no matter what struggles we go through, no matter what fears we have, that we would trust in you. Open our eyes to see that you are moving and working through our lives, through your angels, through every corner of this earth. Help us, O oh Lord, to be confident. Forgive us for those times when we, when we give in to our fears, when we give in to our despair. Help us to be confident in you, to know that your victory was won on the cross once and for all. That when Jesus, your son, gave his life, that no longer Satan had no further victory, but he had lost once and for all. May this be our confidence and our assurance that although we die, we shall live, that we shall rise with you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.